welcome everyone. I'm Zoe. I'm so excited that you're here. This was, um, this is a training, hey, that was um, requested for communications to host so that everyone kind of has some tips and best practices. So here we are. Let's go to the next slide, please, and the next slide. So we're just going to kind of breeze through lowercase versus capitalization rules. Um, and you're welcome to make notes, ask questions, anything. Whenever we're saying APD, obviously we've got the capital APD. But if we're saying members of the agency or staff from the agency, we lowercase the A. I've seen a lot of capitalization, but we, we have decided to lowercase it. Anytime we have a, a WSC annual report, lowercase. Autism in the middle of a sentence, obviously, would be lowercase. Cerebral palsy, circle of supports, cost plans and service plans, developmental disability, intellectual disability, spina bifida, it is the waiting list, lowercase, and the waiver program. Make sense? Alrighty, next slide. Um, some of our personal capitalization rules. Um, services, so if it's respite, support coordination, personal supports, we're capitalizing those. Um, consumer directed care plus has the hyphen because it's, con it's directed by a consumer. CDC plus consultants and representatives, those are capitalized. Where's Jill? <laughs> um, home and community based services, community based is hyphenated and it's HCBS. The next generation questionnaire for situational information, NGQSI, no hyphen. Person centered support plan, if it's the official person-centered support plan, we have our hyphen, we capitalize it. I have seen sort of a generic term. Have we seen their support plan? Do we have a support plan? And that can be lowercase, it's more of a general phrase. Significant additional needs, SAN, or if we have multiple SANs or you're going through a stack of SANs, you can add the S at the end, obviously. Um, state office, regional office, region, those are capitalized. Um, and then titles like if you're a support employment coach, supported living coach, capitalized. And then obviously we have a support coordinator, we capitalize um, WSC. Any questions on that kind of thing? Okay. Um, next slide. These get a little tricky. Down syndrome is one that you'll see a lot of different ways, but the correct spelling in this country, <laughs> this agency is down, capital D, no apostrophe S, syndrome lowercase. Prater Willey, capital syndrome lowercase. Phelan McDermid, lowercase syndrome. The I budget waiver, but lowercase waiver. <coughs> APD I connect for trademark reasons. APD always has to be in front of I connect. Yeah, I learned that um, a couple months ago, <laughs> but that's like a new, that's, that's definitely kind of a emerging thing that I know people still haven't heard. Um, the I budget handbook, we capitalize the H, but there's also the super long name, which I don't need to put up here, but that's also capitalized. It's the name of the I budget handbook. Clarent, um, I think pretty much everybody by now knows Clarent used to be Delmarva, cap it's capitalized and pronounced Clarent. Any questions on that kind of stuff? Alrighty. Um, we call our um, the customers or clients. I know that consumers, if it's an APD I connect in that system, we call them consumers and also in iBudget, I believe. That's what I've heard. Um, so I understand um, in those instances, it's appropriate to use consumer. Um, in terms of a lot of our communications, brochures, the champion, that kind of thing, we will call them customers. Um, clients is also fine. I know WSCs, a lot of times we'll call them clients. Um, a couple of times I'd seen non-paid, but it's unpaid supports and services. Fiscal year, um, everybody I think pretty much knows this. You can, you know, fiscal year 2019 use the FY, and then it's totally fine to say FY 2019-2020 or just FY 19-20. Um, in presentations, um, especially PowerPoints, we try to minimize the clip art and kind of anything that is distracting from the main message that the staff member is presenting because the focus should be on the presenter and their expertise. Um, and um, keep the, so if you, I don't know if anybody is not familiar with the phrase justified margins, but when you're in a Word document, 
you can select to have all the words on kind of aligned on the left side, all the words aligned on the right, center, whatever. Or you can have kind of everything look like a newspaper column where it's aligned on both sides. Um, that can cause some really wonky spacing issues. So we, I think pretty much everybody here keeps all the stuff left justified. And you can center a title if you want to. But um, Oxford comma, um, if you do not um, familiar with that phrase, um, that means that you have A, something like dogs, comma, cats, comma, and horses. You don't have dogs, comma, cats, and horses. This makes sure that we are very clear about what the individual items are that we're listing, and there's no kind of confusion about um, that two things might be connected. I know that's a lot of information. <laughs> are we good so far? Yes? So the example you have in the parentheses is what you prefer? Yes, A, a comma, B, comma, B, and C. Okay. Yep, and Kelly. For this layer, this layer, a lot of a lot of stuff that we get from that time in our LBR stuff, a lot of times we do 2019 dash from this. Oh not, yeah, that's not one of your options, but that's like that's like a common way that we receive you. Is that fine? That's fine too. There's. Okay. I'm fine with that. Unless anyone has a challenge about it, that's also fine. There's really, there's not a horrible way to do it. I did want to bring it up as like, it's okay to do FY 1920 or whatever, but that's also fine. We're happy to do one. That's fine. I'm not worried about that. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Next slide, please. All righty. Um, these are just general tips and formatting things that I've noticed. I'm gonna cross the screen. Sorry, my head will be in the way for a second. Um, be sure to triple check Akka versus Acha. That's happened more than once. And I know that we just like, we say it so many times, but typing it just like, take a second. Officially, CMS has an ampersand in the middle, not an A-N-D. That is their logo. That is their official trademark name. So Centers for Medicare, ampersand Medicaid. Um, Florida statutes with a T. A couple of times we've seen statues, just one of those things you're typing super fast, but it's fine. Um, when you use EG, that means for example. When it's IE, it's in other words. I know this is kind of elementary, but I like to think of it as EG for egg sample, <laughs> but that's how I remember it. <laughs> um, email has no hyphen in it. That was changed a few years ago now in standard. Online, internet, website, all lowercase, all one word. Um, fewer versus less than, people have gotten pretty lax about it. It's not going to you know, kill me either way, but the idea is if you have individual items, I have, I have fewer than five bags, and if you have less than for bulk or quantity, I'm trying to even think like, less than five million or, um, would be fine. Um, less than five million dollars, whatever. Um, toward, not towards. Um, and then this is a relatively recent um, adjustment to AP style, which is what we keep to. Um, if instead of saying his or her everything, it is appropriate um, to say there, which in terms of space is great <laughs> because then you're only having to use one word. Um, other conventions to remember, if it's a number, one through nine, you can write it out. If it's um, 11, 15, whatever, use the numeral, and that's kind of an easy way. There's a couple of instances where it's not, but you know, if you have a question, we can always help talk it through. Um, it's best to keep sentences short and simple. There's a lot of information that's really complicated and it's understandable. And there are times when we're speaking to lawyers, we're speaking with legislators, we can have a little more freedom with that. But in general, you want people to understand what you're saying. So, you know, you try to keep it as short and simple as possible. Um, if there is a number at the beginning of a sentence, like 85, you would spell it out. 85 people are at the meeting, you would spell out 85. Um, you can use the percent sign, which is a very recent adjustment to the rule, instead of spelling out percent. And staff is single, singular, so we appreciate the staff, I'm trying to think, like, you know, the staff helps the clients rather than the staff help the clients. Any questions on that stuff? All righty, moving on. Um, about nine years ago, 
the change was made. Instead of you have a period and then two spaces, now it's a period and one space, um, which um, after the typewriter kind of died, no one needed two spaces anymore after the period. And if it's not, <laughs> which it died a lot earlier than 2010, but you know. And if it's not a full sentence and it's a bullet point, you don't have to worry about a period. If it's a full sentence period, um, that kind of thing's pretty explanatory. Um, quotation marks are fun. Make sure, like, so an apostrophe is the one little flying comma. And then quotation marks are the two. Um, if we have a quote that's totally appropriate to use, you have a period or a comma, it goes inside. Exclamation points, question marks can go inside if they're part of the quote. For example, are you ready? Um, but if it's not, who, like who asked are you ready, you would put the, it outside. This doesn't really apply as much to the, our day-to-day -day stuff. It's useful to know. Nancy, do you have a question? Yes, um, on the first, when it's if not a full sentence, don't end with a period. Do you see in communications or whatever when we're, when we're reviewing that people are switching from sentences to phrases without a in bullets? Oh, yeah, especially, yeah, especially if, like, and I will even do this, too, especially if I'm just writing kind of off the top of my head trying to get stuff on paper. Some of my thoughts are in complete sentences, and some of them aren't. Um, but in terms of if you're presenting a bulleted list of information, it's nice to either all of them be phrases with no period or all of them be full sentences with a period, just in consideration for the reader. Yes, ma'am. Oh, yes, of course. So the, the most recent question was, when you have a bulleted list, are we seeing a lot of people kind of mix and match full sentences and, and phrases and, and periods and not periods? And I think it's, um, it's understandable if it's in a draft, but the consideration is to try and keep it consistent. Um, OK, yes. And, Occasionally, people will try to use a quotation mark to emphasize something, like if you, the way you would speak, but that's not really the appropriate use of them, um, so we try to avoid that. All righty. Any questions on quotation marks? Yes? Just a point about the quotation marks to emphasize something. I'm going to hand you my mic so that she looks at you. <laughs> In theory. <laughs> Uh, just a point about the quotation marks to emphasize something. It often reads as sarcastic when you do that. Mm -hmm. So that's why it's important not to, especially when you're talking in certain contexts that we've seen uh, where it, it, it's, you definitely don't want it to come across as sarcastic. That's fair. Thank you. All righty. Yes. What would you use to emphasize something? Would you do it in caps? Would you do it in bold? Would you do it in... Um, italics. In what instance would you need to emphasize something? If you're trying to make a point within a sentence and there's a part of it that really needs oh, to like be paid attention to, yes. it's totally fine to bold it. I have also seen capitalized and bolded. I mean, if it's an advisory and you're like, it, payroll will not happen, right. <laughs> then yeah, if it's capitalized, bolded, those are fine. Quotation what about answer. italics? In AP style, we don't use italics. Okay. That's the official. I see a lot of italics. That's the reason mm -hmm. I'm asking. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I probably use a lot of italics. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Mindy. Just, uh, just kind of off of that, I've always been uh, used the rule of, especially in emails, if you're sending something, if you're trying to emphasize something, italics is, is less um, harsh than bold or capital. And is yes less like yelling and more like an <laughs> emphasis, so no italics at all. In emails, I'm not going to be super obsessive. I mean, that's personal, you know. I mean, as long as it's, it's public record, everything's public record. But like, that's kind of more of a personal preference, in my opinion. Okay. Amanda? What about, so um, because we use, um, quotation marks sometimes for colloquialisms like if you want to say like for instance I had to write something where I was talking about mail outs that we ran um, a lot at once so it was a mass mail out 
but I use quotation marks because I we don't have a con we don't have a title for that kind of thing. So somebody people call it bulk mail out. So I just wanted to say like this is our colloquialism, not like an official title. I think mass mail out doesn't. It's self explanatory enough. It's a general term. I don't think you would need quotation marks there. Mm -mm. Yeah. Other questions? Yes. I can answer that too. I would say if you're going to use something as a colloquialism, identify it as a term the first time. So if you're going to put something in quotes, it's because it's either a term, a technical term, or or else it reads as sarcasm. So I'd say this thing that this document that is called or this process that is called mail 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 what is it uh, mass mass yeah. mail out uh, the first time identify it as a term and then it's um, then it's acceptable usually um, mm -hmm. but after and then after that then it makes sense. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jamie. Jamie has. Um, even more experience in terms of education, in terms of writing. So I'm very excited that she's on our team <laughs> because she is our resident uh, multiple degrees in English expert, uh, ex expert there. Uh, okay. Um, apostrophes. Um, <laughs> this holiday season, you may receive Christmas cards or holiday cards that say, Happy Holidays from the Linnefelds. There should be no apostrophe in there because it is a multiple of a, a person <laughs> in a weird way of saying that. WSCs, if you have five WSCs, there's no apostrophe. <clears throat> if you have, if it is a purse owned by a WSC, then that's fine because it shows that they own something. Customers is the same. Um, if it's multiple of something, you don't need an apostrophe. Um, you can show a possession if it's the customer's plan. That's totally fine to use an apostrophe S. And if there's multiple, if there's something owned by multiple people, you put the apostrophe at the end. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, nonprofit, I even see pr public relations professionals that will hyphenate nonprofit. AP style says not hyphenating. And ongoing is not hyphenated. If you have a one on one meeting, Here's an example of when you would use a hyphen. This is getting a little in the weeds, but if these, this cluster of words is kind of bound to describe that word, it's like a little backpack that that word is, it has on its back. So it's one-on-one -on -one meeting. Um, and if you have a slash separating two words, you do not need a space in between those. Questions? All righty, let's do the next slide. <clears throat> So I know that's a lot of grammar rules, but hopefully that helps <clears throat> when you have a question come up in your mind. Um, tips for editing for yourself or your, co your colleagues. Um, if you are saying, if, you, if your sentence is too kind of long and complex, be sure to check that the action word or the verb that you're using is appropriate for all of the things that are attached to that sentence. Um, Jamie, can you think of it again? I was gonna be like, my brain can't think. The, the parallel structure is like, so the verb type that you use should be typically the same. So in a list, well, well I guess in a list as well. So you wouldn't say he's biking, riding, and swimming. You, you would say he's biking, riding, and swimming. You wouldn't say he's biking, rides, and, is, uh, and will swim. Right, so when we have these long lists of strings of things together, a lot of times we see this, it's sort of, we, we don't pay attention to the things that we're putting in our lists. Um, and we don't pay attention to those verbs or those nouns that are, uh, nouns that are gerund nouns, anyway, <laughs> uh, off, off point. Uh, but we don't pay attention to those and then we sort of, it gets confusing because your reader doesn't know what point to go back to because the, the Anyway, I'm not going to go into too much of that, but yeah. <laughs> so the type of verb, so if you use an ing word in your list, all your words should be ing yes. words. ed words, all of your words should end with ed. Um, yeah, exactly. Thank you, Jamie. If I can get this to pin back on myself here. Okay. Um, obviously, Microsoft Word has spell check, hooray. It um, also has this super cool read aloud feature. 
um, that you can click and it'll have a person's computer voice read it out for you, which is handy because then sometimes just hearing something out loud is helpful. Um, or you can read it out loud yourself. Feel free to ask a coworker to read it or we're always available to help um, read through things as long as you kind of give us the timeline of when you need something back. And yeah, next slide please. So is now a good time, Karen, if you'd want to come chat about some grammar punctuation and style rules for the policies and procedures. I will hand you this. Okay. Thank you. If it'll clip me. <laughs> That's <laughs> good. That's good. So this, I'd like to call this just APD policies and procedures part one. There's definitely going to be a part two that I'd love to work with communications on as we get into a lot more detail. But I was excited when I saw that communications was going to do this because as you know, the world of policies and procedures is it's a really old world, but it's also a really new world for APD. Um, and we've learned a whole lot since we've actually been focusing on it. So there's just a few things I wanted to share with you because any chance I'd get to get in front of folks to talk about what's happening in our, with our policies and with our operating procedures, I want to take a, advantage of that. I mean, let's start with the power of the written word, which is what, you know, why this is, this is so important because what we write and how we phrase things and how people read them is so, so important when you think about our policies and our operating procedures. So, um, in fact, I'm going to use a lot of this as we do editing. Now, communications does editing on some of our policies and OPs, but so does everybody else who's in the routing process. They, they look at it. And um, so these are going to be great guidelines for us to, to use as we move forward. But I just wanted to share with you just a few things that are happening in, in the world of policies. Um, and, and procedures, kind of writing the APD really, way really includes how we write, how we revise, how we update, how we develop any of our policies and, and OPs. Um, and there's a difference between policies and procedures, if I can share this with you, because a lot of, we used to use them interchangeably. Oh, well, we'll just, you know, let's just call it an OP or let's just call it an, a policy without really any rhyme or reason. My understanding was it's because there would always ensue this argument and, and heated debate about what's a policy and what's a procedure. And so a long while ago, um, I guess it was decided, well, let's just use any of it. It doesn't really matter. But it really does matter because a policy, it's really, it's, it reflects our ultimate mission. It directs APD in making decisions. Um, and a procedure is really a set of actions, specific methods employed to express policies in action day-to-day -day operations of the agency. We follow a policy and we use a procedure. And if I may, I'm going to use kind of what we've been going through with our zero tolerance policy in OPs. I'm looking at, at Christy and Demetra because they, they suffer through with us every single Tuesday morning because we've wrapped a discipline around this writing. And so we have a zero tolerance policy. You know, we have for so many years said, APD has a policy against abuse, neglect, exploitation, and sexual misconduct. But we haven't had a written policy. We say it, um, but we hadn't had it. So we, we started with that. Because in this agency, we are focusing first on clients' health and welfare and safety, and then anything that puts a, you know, is risky to the agency. So those are our top two that we're focusing on. So we wrote this group, disciplined, every Tuesday morning, wrote a policy on zero tolerance. And then we are following it with an operating procedure that Christy is the author of it, out from program standpoint for zero tolerance, and then an operating procedure that Cassandra Jenkins is in charge of, author of, for operations, but it, they will all follow. You know, they will follow the zero tolerance policy. So that's an example of the of the difference between them. And all policies and operating procedures that we have today are are on our intranet. You can go onto the intranet and you can look at them, um, and you can say, "Oh my God, this is so old." Yeah. 
no one's really paid this kind of attention to it before, so now we really, really are. And I really do believe in every single thing that you've already seen and you will see when it comes to writing. Standardization is so important. We have a table of contents. It's not a suggested table of contents. It's a table of contents that we shall follow for all policies and operating procedures. Some will come back and they'll want to add things in there and they'll want to change some things and for the reader, it is not helpful to them to see all kinds of different structures out there. You know, we need, to, we need to have a discipline around that. It's just like a writing discipline. It's similar for policies and operating procedures. So um, we have a policy on policies, um, which, you know, the minute you write something, when it comes to a document that really people have to follow, the next day it becomes obsolete and that is okay because we are ever changing. We like to write something that will have some semblance of longevity, um, but we also know that if something changes, it might change in rule, it might change in statute, we need to change our ROP or our, or our policy and that's okay. So um, we're constantly looking at that written word, you know, and, and if this is something we're going to publicize for our employees, and you know, a policy, here's another thing, policies and OPs are directly for our employees. They are not how we tell others, our providers, et cetera, what to do. It's for us. It's how we operate. And I think that's another important point that a, a lot of folks don't necessarily see. If we want to put something for providers to follow, we have to put it in rule or we have to follow, you know, put it in statute. So that, that's another thing. We do suggest, we, no, we don't suggest. We tell one that um, all of our policies and OPs need to be in Arial 12 point. They have to look alike. They have to have the same kind of flow to them. And then we have subject matter experts in all of them and they need to be involved. So the process is we either have and need, it needs to be revised, a policy or an OP, or we need one because we are absolutely sans that policy or OP and we need some kind of directive for our, for our staff. And so then we find out who is the subject matter expert. They start to pull people together. They start to write. Some of them are short. They, take, they only take a short period of time. Some of them take quite a while because there's so many nuances and there's so many connections um, to them. So um, we try to establish how long is it going to take. So once something is drafted, we then determine who needs to see it? Who needs to review it? Does communications need to review it? Is it one of those things where multiple business units are involved and we need to get Grindy involved to process map it because it's confusing? And a good example of that is what we do with background checks. There are so many hands in it. You know, DCF is involved and we're involved and different business units are involved and HR is involved. And, and so that needs to be process mapped. And the power of it is the process. It's sitting around and really talking it through, putting it up on the screen and looking at the words, making sure that we have the Oxford commas because there's a big difference between having one and not having one in the meaning of what it is that we're trying to say. So, um, so there's a lot going on with that. And then, um, and then lastly, I mean, I, I'm kind of a policy wonk. I really am. I mean, I, I really am a nerd when it comes to the words, the, the, the language that we use, because it means so much. And that's why you have as many people as, you, as we need to be looking over things, because you might interpret something very differently than I would interpret it, and we would need to talk about that. It's like, what are we saying to the staff? Because we are writing these for our own employees. That's the purpose of this. So, I mean, we talk about the purpose in each one of the policies and the OPs, and then we bring in the authorities and references. It might be rules. It might be statute. It might be other policies. It might be something that ACA puts out. It might be a CMS um, regulation that we need to follow, depending on what it is. And then the scope, who is it for? And that's important that the, that the group thinks about who needs to see this, who needs to follow it. And then we have definitions. Huh. I got to tell you, we, <laughs> there are definitions all over the board in this agency. We can have one word define 10 ways 
And so we've started a definition bank, and I've only just started it. I mean, there's going to be hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of words. And what we need is, once we get this bank done, we need all the eyes on it to look at it and say, wait a minute, that's not what this means. You know, or we, you forget this whole thing. We need to add this part of it. So. Um, I will never live long enough to get all of this done, but it's very exciting to see what the what the final product is going to be. So we're we're on the road. I guess that that's what I can say. We're on the road. We're moving it. We're moving it forward. Um, and then the procedures. What are the procedures in what it, whatever it is we're trying to follow? You know, what's the guidebook? You know, um, and we do see that whole thing of full sentences versus bullets, and do we use a period or not? I'm taking this PowerPoint. I'm telling you, next time I edit it, you know, to, to look at that and make sure, or either that, or I'll just give it to you, Zoe. <laughs> you know, I could just I could just do that. Um, and then we talk about enforcement. If we don't follow this, then what? for our staff, that's where HR comes in. Sometimes we have to really make sure that it backs us up to make sure we can enforce things that are really, really important, especially when it comes to client safety. So, and then how often do we revise it? Not enough. Um, so that's, that's another opportunity that we have to revise it. So once this, just to finish this up, once, um, a policy or an OP is written, we decide who needs to see it, we put it in fast tracks, we have a discipline about it and people can get nagged a little if they're slowing down and they're not reading it. Um, and finally, when we have the final document, we have our chief of staff sign it. Um, now the zero tolerance policy, because it comes under the chief of staff, we had the director sign it. Um, and because it's so important, it's such an underlying policy for the whole agency. But we have our chief of staff sign it. Um, I send Mr. Milton all of this and he posts it and he lets everybody know around the, around the state that we have a new policy or operating procedure that can be reviewed and, and, and followed. Um, there's been a lot of suggestions that we do kind of a lunch and learn when we have new ones so that we can kind of talk to people about what it really means, folks who weren't involved in the development of it. So that's maybe policy and procedure part two. So thank you for letting me get in front of you and talk to you about it. So, thank you so yes. Much. About your definitions, thank you. Um, I would suggest, I don't know if you may have already done this, but um, go to your rules, because all of our rules have a big long list of definitions in the front of it. And I know the rule that we just pretty much finished with, we actually have some definitions in there that we know to be different from how other people define that word. But for the purposes of our rule, that's what that definition means. And that's a really good point, thank you. And it reminded me of something I did not say. In the routing um, process that we follow, one of the first folks who get it is our rules attorney to make sure that anything that we put in our policies or OPs shouldn't be or is you know, listed in a rule. So what you're talking about with the definitions goes hands in hand, hand in hand with that. So um, thank you for that, appreciate it. So there might be a part two, maybe we can do something like that um, with communications later. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Karen. So Sheila, if you didn't hear Lori's suggestion was to um, check in rule because there are definitions in there that are important to, uh, to reference when you're also coming up with a policy or procedure. Okay, sure. Other questions, everybody good? Okay, let's move on. So um, I have a um, Word doc of this too, if you want me to send it to you, I will. But this is a kind of high level showing of what a business letter looks like. Um, Probably everyone is already familiar with this format, um, but I, especially when I flip the, I'll flip the date. I'm not sure where the date goes or whatever. You have your date, you have your name, your title, address, your salutation, and then um, the message and your um, closing and your name. We have letterhead. So this is the current letterhead with our current um, administration information on there. Any questions on business letter? Okay. Next slide, please. Um, there is an entire training about plain language um, through as you become a new employee, you take this plain language training, but just wanted to remind a few things. When you're writing something, think about what you want the reader to do. Do they want to, do you want them to do something? Then you better make sure that it makes, it's clear for them to understand what they're supposed to do. Um, if they're, so the, 
English term for this would be um, who is the subject and putting the subject at the beginning of a sentence. But just think through who is, who is doing something. Is it, um, is it communications director Melanie Mori Edders? And just have them at the beginning of the sentence and then have the action word after. Um, that way people understand, OK, who am I thinking about? And then what are they doing? Um, this was a good um, message submitted. If you want someone to just notice the words, you can use the longest, most flowery words you want. But if you want them to notice your ideas, use the simplest word. And that way, it's clear. Um, in terms of reading level, just think about your audience. If you're talking to a legislator, think about how they would want to hear it. Think about the words, the key words they would want to hear. If you're talking to a lawyer, if you're talking to a mom, if you're, I mean, you, you already know because you work with different um, types of people. Um, in general, it's good to keep the vocabulary, the reading level to a high school level. For Make sure we um, have our clearest, easiest to understand words. Get to the point quickly, be clear and direct. Um, obviously, there are terms that we use and that we need to use, and that's totally fine. But um, if we get too into the jargon, technical terms, and we're talking to someone who doesn't understand that, either we need to define it, and then they'll understand it, or we need to think about the simplest way to phrase it. Questions on that kind of thing? OK. And that also helps if you share it with someone else, maybe who's not in your immediate um, division, maybe help make sure they, you know, if they understand it, then we're good. Next slide, please. Um, everybody already knows emails are public record. Sometimes emails can be perceived in a funky way. <laughs> um, sometimes um, a conversation is best. Sometimes decisions can happen quicker if you walk down the hall or you pick up the phone or um, click a Skype link and we can just talk about it. And then that way, tone of voice comes through better and um, then there's no issues there. Any questions on that? Okay. I mean, Skype is also public record, though, right? Yes, I believe it is. Lawyers, yes, um, in terms of the messages, yes. But in terms of like, I guess I mean, if you want to talk through a problem instead of emailing 600 pages and then sending it, just be like, can we just talk about this a second? <laughs> Next slide, please. There are letterhead and PowerPoint templates on our intranet <coughs> in the communication section. So you can always download the current administration um, letterhead. And there's a couple different versions of the PowerPoint that you're welcome to use. Um, and there are some older ones um, now that those are still fine to use, too. We just updated it with some kind of fresh colors. Um, and if you need photos, I think someone had asked me in the parking lot the other day, hey, can I grab a photo that I saw on one of your you know, um, champion newsletters? And so come talk to us, and we have a, a good um, library of photos. Um, and we make sure that um, they have signed a waiver um, if they're a client. Because otherwise, if they haven't said, yes, my information may be shared, that's, that's their personal health information. We want to be respectful of that. Um, questions on that? Everybody knows where to find that. Okay, cool. Next slide, please. We also have brochures on our public website in three different languages. They are translated into their English and translated into Spanish and Creole as well. <clears throat> so if you have someone who's requesting a particular um, set of information, that's a good place to start because those have been professionally translated and they're up available for download. There's also the resource directory. Does anybody not know what the resource directory is? OK, good. And the Florida Navigator. OK, yeah, those are just great resources. If um, sometimes with public inquiries and correspondence, that's a good place to um, suggest that people look for resources in their area. And we also have social media channels. If you follow, if you know, you're on Facebook or Twitter, feel free to follow us. And um, we share a lot of information, whether it's about the Florida housing you know, search or ABLE United. Um, about the resource directory, all those different things. Um, and we promote different brochures, but that's also a good place to find information. Hope everybody felt like this was useful <laughs> and informative. Um, like I said, Jamie and I are available. Tim's available. Obviously, Melanie is always available as well to help through things. But I appreciate you all attending. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> Thank you.